believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command my belief in action. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Well, it was early Saturday morning. Dad got up, strolled into the kitchen, bleary-eyed, and his daughter was up already. She had a notebook open, and she was feverishly drawing something. He said, well, good morning, honey. What you working on? And she stopped for a second, and she looked up, and she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And then went back to work passionately, and Dad said, honey, how are you going to do that? No one knows what God looks like. And she looked up from her notepad and said, oh, they will when I get done. <laughs> and see, all of us have a notepad, and from our childhood on, we've been drawing this picture of God, every person. Everyone, from little kids to grown-ups, we have this mental picture of God. You have one, so do those around you. Even people who say they don't believe in God, they've got this image of God. And I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the image of God that is hanging in your mental gallery? See, everybody's got this image of God that's hanging in the the gallery of their heart, and it's profoundly important. In fact, we're starting this believe journey, addressing the image of God inside of our heart, because that image, it shapes who we are and how we live, and it's impacted by a lot of things. It's impacted by your life experiences, your church experiences, the family that you grew up in, and most especially your earthly parents. Uh, when you do what I do as a pastor for as long as I have done it, you realize that for many people, their statements about God, many of them, if not most of them, are emotionally and psychologically connected to their earthly parents. In other words, we all have this human tendency to project onto God the traits of our earthly parents. So if dad was a tyrant, then when I'm drawing this picture of God, my default will be to assume that God is also a tyrant. If my dad was passive and distant, then my default image of God that I'll draw in my heart will be a God who's passive and distant. And see, all of these experiences, especially in the family we grew up with, they combine to form this picture of God that's hanging in our heart. And here's what I've discovered about my image of God. You remember that movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? It's like, Honey, I Shrunk My God. The image of God that's in my heart, is, it, it's twisted, it, it's warped. It needs healing, it, it needs correcting, it needs upgrading, and the good news is that's why Jesus came. He came to heal our image of God. He came to bring us a revelation of the true nature and character of God. If we're gonna walk on this amazing path that Jesus has for us, it starts by letting him heal our image of God. A.W. Tozer said it this way, and Randy quoted this last week, but I want you to hear it again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And the place for us to begin is to realize we're like little kids with our notepads and our crayons and we desperately need God to help heal our image of God. We need to mind what Jesus has in mind. We need to think what Jesus thinks and trust that he is our guide, our ultimate artist to help us get a image in our heart of God that is in alignment with the actual God, who is the ground of all being. And last week, you remember where we kicked this off, we asked the question, who is God? And I wanna give you a chance to, to say it out loud together, our belief, our core belief from last week, it was this, I believe that the God of the Bible is the only true God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this week, we're going to pick up right from that point. There is this God who is ultimate reality. He's the creator and sustainer of all that is. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the great I am. And there's this mystery of the three in one. 
where God is a community in and of himself. And, and all of this is, it, it's beyond our comprehension. And then we ask this question, is that great, big, awesome, holy, eternal, transcendent God, does he actually care about me? And that's today's question. Does he actually care about me? Does God care? And today's core belief, again, we're memorizing these core beliefs, not to impress each other or to get some kind of religious browning points, but you know, in the front of your belief book, there's a key, right? In these beliefs, we're asking that God would use that key to open up the door to our heart and that we wouldn't just give lip service to these beliefs, but we'd give them soul service. They wouldn't just be intellectual assent, but they would drop down to the deepest place of our being and, and become, in essence, like the engine that shapes our sense of identity and how we live. And so today's core belief, I invite you to say it out loud with me. It might be on these screens, but I'm gonna block it so you can't cheat, all right? <laughs> Ready, let's give it a shot. I believe that God is involved and cares about my daily life. Well done, like you people actually know this stuff. It's pretty impressive, yeah, woo! I'm wooting myself, woo! You know, you did it. And if you think about this statement, I mean, it's kind of audacious, isn't it? To think that this, this magnificent, omniscient, omnipotent God would actually care about me. I mean, at one level, it's kind of narcissistic if you think about it. Like, the, think about the expanse of the universe and then the God who created it. Like, that he would actually be interested in the details of my life? Really? I think about it from this angle. Like, we all have favorite artists, for example, and we have no expectation that they're going to care about us personally. Like, you two came to town, you know, last year, Michelle and I. We spent a truckload of money. We got the tickets. We went. And I couldn't believe it. None of the guys reached out after the concert to say thank you. <laughs> None of them. Not a text. Nothing. You know? And, I mean, Bono and I, it's like, in my mind, we've been best friends since I was 15, you know? And, I, and see, that's why Bono has security guards to protect him from people like me <laughs> who think we have a personal relationship, and we don't. You know, that's called being a stalker. And I think it's a legitimate question to ask, like, is it just really narcissism where I'm like in this pretend relationship with God that I'm projecting on him? I mean, if I don't get access to Bono, you're telling me I get access to the great I am, that the great I am is down with little old me? Wow. And Jesus' simple answer to that question is yes. Yes. And if you're in this journey, if you did your reading this week from chapter two, you'll find person after person after person, first Abraham and Sarah, and then Hagar, and then we looked at Hezekiah and Jeremiah and David, and person after person, and then Jesus is teaching the nobodies of his culture, and over and over again, we're seeing that God is involved in and does care about the details of these people's lives, and at a very basic level, you know what the Bible is? It's a document that records people saying, I can't believe it. The God who created everything, he's actually involved in and cares about my daily life. It's a record of people's experiences and their encounters with God and God healing their image of him to bring it into alignment with ultimate reality with the God who actually is. And we're invited into that journey. And I wanna look at Genesis chapter 16 today, in particular, the person of Hagar. And in this passage, uh, there's two movements. First of all, God sees Hagar and they connect eye to eye. And then Hagar sees God. So first, God sees Hagar. And then second, Hagar sees God. And if you'll open up your belief book, if you've got it with you, uh, you need to turn to page 31. Page 31. And uh, actually, before we read that passage, let me give us a little bit of the backstory. Now, God has seeing Abraham, and he appears to Abraham, and Abraham sees God, and God makes a promise to him. He said, I'm going to make you into a nation. I'm gonna create a people who will partner with me to join in the, in the redeeming and renewing of all things, and I'm gonna bless you, and you'll be a blessing to all nations. So it's not just for you. It's about you becoming a servant to the rest of the world. And, and so I'm gonna give you a son. Now, the challenge is that that Abraham and Sarah are getting older and older and older and older. I mean, they're old. 
They get the free seniors coffee at McDonald's. They get all the AARP discounts. Like if this baby is born, it's gonna be born in the geriatric ward. If this baby is born, Sarah's the only mom at Price Chopper buying Depends and Pampers at the same time. <laughs> These are for Abraham, you know. These are for our baby. Like this, it, it can't happen. It's a miracle. It's gonna need to be a miracle. And they're waiting year after year, very hopeful at first, year after year after year after year, and the miracle doesn't happen. So Abraham and Sarah decide, I guess we're gonna have to help God out. And there's a, a custom in the ancient world where a person's slave or maidservant, the woman's maidservant, could basically stand in. And surprise, surprise, Abraham was like, yeah, I'm good with that. That's okay, hon, yeah, let's do that. Because he's a dude, you know what I mean? And then surprise, surprise, uh, epic envy ensues. Oh, I alliterated by accident, that was pretty good. Epic envy ensues. And it reaches to a point a climax where Sarah just hates Hagar. And uh, Abraham and Sarah kick her to the curb with that little baby inside of her. And she's in a desperate spot. And you have to realize that part, you know, where if she was gonna go back to her homeland, like the terrain there was so rugged and so impossible and so difficult. So she probably got kicked out. She probably had no supplies except the clothes on the back, on her back. Uh, she's very, very vulnerable. There were trading routes there, so it'd be very likely that nomadic traders, if they saw her, they would grab her, they would rape her, they would probably then just resell her as a slave to somebody else. That's what Hagar's up against. And then just making that kind of uh, trek, the exertion, I mean, a newborn mom could very likely just lose the baby. And she makes her way to the spring and just collapsed in her isolation, in her brokenness. And then God finds her. And that's the first thing I want you to see is that God sees Hagar by finding her. And I want to read this together. Now, um, page 31, around verse 7. The angel of the Lord, what does it say? Found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And the first thing I want you to see is that God sees Hagar by finding her. God sees Hagar by finding her. She wasn't looking for God, but God was looking for her and God found her when she was broken. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Psalm 32, 11, it says God is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those that are crushed in spirit. Do you wanna know what God's address is? It's Broken Hearted Boulevard. And God specializes in broken hearted ragamuffins. And he wants to save those that are crushed in spirit. And that's exactly where Hagar is. She is on Broken Hearted Boulevard with no options. And she's not looking for God, but thank God, amazing grace, God was looking for her. And he found her. And see, that's one of the things that's unique about Jesus and the God who reveals to us. All the other major world religions of the world are about men searching and trying to find God. But Jesus shows us a God who is searching and finding us. All of the religions, it's about this intellectual, philosophical, religious quest to get up to the mountain and see if we can see God and name him. But what Jesus shows us is God is rushing down the mountain to meet us in our brokenness, and he knows our name, and he finds us. What a relief, because we're not smart enough to find God on our own. We need God to come and find us. And over and over again, I would say millions of times, even today, God is finding people on Broken Hearted Boulevard. And my favorite stories are when people tell the stories of how God found them. My Believe group, I've got um, a group of guys who are meeting in our neighborhood on Mondays. And it's guys from our hood and a couple neighboring neighborhoods. And uh, one of my friends I invited to be in that, his name is Josh, and we've been getting to know each other over the summer. And, and uh, he told a part of his story uh, that last Monday night that I'd never heard before. It's a God finding him story. And he said, you know, I grew up in the church, and then when I got out of my home, I kind of just ran the other direction. 
I, was, I wanted to be large and in charge, and I just wanted to enjoy life, and my enjoyment got out of hand, and I actually ended up in an addiction, and uh, things were kind of spiraling out of control, but I still wanted more of the pleasure, and I didn't really want anything to do with God at that point in time. And then things got really, really dark. He said my first daughter, when she was one years old, she died of SIDS. And there's no words to describe that space on Broken Hearted Boulevard. And he said, I was so angry at God. And then shortly thereafter, just a few weeks later, his best friend's son was injured terribly in a car accident. And he said, that was it. I'm like, I'm, if there is a God, I'm done with him. I'm done with him. About a week after that, he said, I was out riding my motorcycle. I'm clipping along. And then before I knew it, at 45 miles an hour, I ran into the back of a pickup truck, launched off of my bike, went through the back window, and ended up in pieces in the truck cab. So the next thing I remember, I'm in the hospital, and I open up my eyes, and he said, I can't explain it, but God was there. And I, it was like warm honey. He said, I knew I was loved. I knew he was present. And he said, I knew it wasn't God who put me in that that cab of the truck. I knew it was physics, but I knew that God now had found me in my brokenness and that he was forgiving me. And he's like, suddenly, I can't explain it. All my arguments and anger melted away, and I knew Jesus was giving me another crack at my life. You see, that's our God. You see, maybe you've been looking for God, and maybe you haven't, but I'm telling you, he's looking for you. And if you're running today, Sit down at the spring like Hagar did. Let him meet you in your brokenness. God wants to find you. He's not against you. He's for you. And God sees Hagar first by finding her. And then what did he do next? You tell me, what did he do next? He said her what? Her name, right? And see, God sees Hagar by calling her name. He calls her name. Now, names have power, more power than most people imagine. If you're doubting me, tell me you don't feel the urge to hide when your mother calls your full name. <laughs> Robert, Wendell, Wagner. It's like, I'm out, you know, <laughs> later. <laughs> I'm afraid of my mom, you know. <laughs> and names are powerful. Is there, think, here's socially awkward situations in the top five. You've met someone, and then the next time you meet, you can't remember their name. And it's so awkward. It's like, hey, hey, dude, how are you? It's good to see you. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm so glad that we got to reconnect. And you're hoping, is there any way I could find a window to like ferret out their name? You know? Like, hey, can I see your driver's license for a second? <laughs> you know, you're like trying to figure out how can I get their name? You know? It's so awkward because when you don't remember the name, it communicates a lack of value. And when you do remember the name, it says, I see you. You matter. And a name is a key that can change a, a stranger to a friend. And when someone knows your name and it's precious on their lips, you can tell. I'm gonna do a name drop, but it, it, please don't think it makes me think I'm a big deal because I'm just a chill dude, right? Um, and there's a pastor some of you may have heard of. His name is Rick Warren. Uh, he's like a counselor to presidents and prime ministers. He has the best-selling nonfiction book of this last century. It's called Purpose Driven Life. And a number of years ago, I was involved with this movement he was leading called Purpose Driven Church. And I made a personal connection with him over a few months, and we got to spend a little time together. Then fast forward years later, years later, he's speaking at a conference I'm attending. I happen to like kind of run into him outside of this building, and he sees me. He's like, Rob! And like, remember me. I was like, whoa. Hey, Rick. And he grabbed me and pulled me over to this picnic table. And I'm sure he had places to be, but he, he stopped and he sat down. He's like, Rob, it's so great to see you. And you know what he said next? He said, how are Michelle, Madeline, Whitney, and Belle? He remembered my wife's name and my three children. And I'm like looking for the handler who handed him the names or something. I'm like, <laughs> and I was blown away. I felt so valued. And as awesome as it is when a super influential pastor, best-selling author remembers your name, it's nothing compared to when the God of the universe knows your name and it's precious on his lips. 
And for some of you right now, you need to sit down by the spring and get still and hear him speak your name. And you may be saying, well, not me, not me. Listen, the reason I wanted to talk about Hagar this morning, she's the most invisible person in all the passages we read this week. I mean, she's the slave, she's the servant, she's the marginalized. And think about how Abraham and Sarah are treating her. It's not like she's in even like an autonomous human being worthy of dignity and respect. She's basically like a receptacle for Abraham's sperm. They, they, it, she's basically like a test tube for them. She's like a rent a womb so that they can have their baby. I mean, that's the way they're using her. Can you imagine the sense of just disrespect? And God comes to her and he says, I see you, I know you, I value you. And no matter what someone else has said about you, no matter how they're treating you, God knows your name. And he approaches you with a sense of dignity and respect. And if he knows Hagar's name, he knows yours. And, and, and so first God sees Hagar. And he does it by finding her. And he does it by calling her name. And I want you to see this third part of this first movement because it's amazing. God sees Hagar by engaging the details of her life. I mean, he calls her by name. And what's the first thing he does? He asks her questions. And they're open-ended questions. He says, where have you come from? In other words, I care about your past. I care about your narrative. I care about the details of your life. And he says, where are you going? In other words, I care about your direction. I care about your destiny. And it's not that God didn't know the answers to those questions already. So why ask it? Because people who love other people ask open-ended questions to communicate value. I can't imagine how shocked she was when God says, I know your name. Where are you been and where are you going? And then what he says next, it's almost beyond belief. He says, the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. That wasn't good news. She was probably like, oh, perfect. You're on Abraham and Sarah's side. This is awesome. But look at what he says next. I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Do you remember who else he gave that promise to? Abraham and Sarah. So he's saying, hey, I know they treated you like dirt, but guess what? I'm giving you the same deal I gave them. I can't imagine how blown away she was. And see, God's up above. He's watching her life. And he knows if Hagar goes back to her homeland, she doesn't have a chance. Like you come back to your homeland with the baby of your enemy tribe, that is not gonna go well with you. And yet Abraham and Sarah are really jacked up, but they are at least responding to God in some fashion and form. They are listening. And God is basically saying, and when you go back to Abraham and Sarah, you're not gonna go alone. I'm getting involved in the details of your life. Look at what he says. I will increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to his son, and you shall name him Ishmael. In other words, I care about your son, and I know his name, for the Lord has heard of your misery. In other words, I'm getting involved in your daily life. I care about your affliction and your pain. I care about you and your baby and your future and your descendants. And remember, there are two movements in this passage. First, God sees Hagar, and then Hagar sees God, and now she responds. And look at how she responds. Jump down um, on page 31 again, verse 13. In response, you can feel her sense of wonder and awe. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. In other words, she says, God sees me, little old me. Hagar is so encouraged and so awed that she gives God a new name, Elroy the God who sees. And now we're back to the beginning. Back to the beginning, drawing the image of God in the hall of our heart. And see, that's exactly what Hagar's doing there. It's like, before I thought God was uninvolved. I, I thought God didn't see me. I thought God didn't care. I didn't know this God, but now I see that he sees me. And that he is involved and he does care. 
And, and her image of God is being healed and transformed and she gives him a new name and in naming him the God who sees, she's saying, I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. And see, that changes everything. See, if you have a God who's distant and uncaring and uninvolved, if that's the image that hangs in the hall of your heart, your life is gonna be filled with so much anxiety and worry and depression and, and, and you'll be constantly up against things that you're like, I know I'm not big enough to handle this and no matter how much I pump myself up, it's just not enough. But if at the depths of your being, you are confident that there is this great big God who is so big that he is eternal and omnipotent, omniscient, and he is the creator and the sustainer, and yet he can become intimate enough. And he knows me by name, and he's found me, and he's involved in my life. That'll fill you with a confidence, a sense of peace, a freedom from fear that you can't find any other way. And that's what Hagar's experiencing in this moment. And see, there are two movements. First, God sees Hagar, and then Hagar sees God, and that changes everything. And her image of God is being healed and being made right and restored. And I've seen this in my life from the very beginning. Over and over again, thousands of times in my life. First, God sees me and he finds me, calls me by name, gets involved in the details of my life. And then I see him and I respond in this image of God and my heart is healed. The first time it happened to me, I was, uh, I was in this weird early onset existential crisis as a young teenager. I don't know, it hit me early. And uh, here was my situation. I found that I had a lot of interest and some basic ability in a lot of different areas. So you know a lot of people kind of pick one click and then they sort of embed into that one group and that's sort of their identity. I was like this free floater. I could float with all the different clicks. So I played baseball and football and, and I had enough capacity where it's like I could hang with the jocks and we could talk ball and I was one of with them. And then I was also in band and I was in first section trumpet so I could be like one of the band people and we could talk band stuff. And then I also played guitar and I was into rock music so I could hang with the metalheads and the stoners. We talked about Zeppelin and Priest and Ozzy and Randy Rhodes and Eddie, you know, like I could flow with them, be one of. I was also like a, you know, had good grades and, and so I could hang out with kind of the geeks and roll with them. And I was a church kid. I could talk church and had the church answers. And I hit this place uh, where I began to feel just like a phony all the time. It's like I have all these masks and I kind of float from one group to another and no one really knows me and I don't actually know who I am and I'm not even sure which one of these masks is the real me and I just feel like a phony. I felt like a Holden and Catcher on the Rye. I'm like, man. And I remember sitting in my bedroom feeling the emptiness of it, and it was this kind of unspoken prayer. I was like, God, if you're there, there's a great big gaping hole. I don't get this in it. That weekend, I'm uh, tagged along with my sister, and she goes to her best friend's house, and she has an older sister, so I'm like hanging out with like the older teens, like their late teens and early 20s, and I'm wearing my mask. I can like, I can roll with these people, you know? And we were playing bumper pool, remember that? That was really cool, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, and there was music playing in the background, and I really enjoyed the guitar work. I was like, wow, this is really good. And then I start listening, and they're singing about God. And I literally said outside, I'm like, are, these, are they singing about God? And uh, my sister's best friend, older sister said, yeah, yeah, these guys in the band, they're, they're all Christians. And uh, they sing about their faith. And I wasn't sure if that was really cool or totally uncool, you know? Wasn't sure if I was like attracted or repelled because it's was like, well, this is rock music, can you do that? And she's like, you've never heard of Christian rock? And I was like, no, I don't know what this is. What is Christian rock, you know? And then uh, two days later, Sunday morning, her, she, she's like in her early 20s, she shows up with a mixtape at church. And she found me, this older woman found me and gave me a mixtape. I was like, yeah, babe, I'll, I'll take a listen. <laughs> like a 21 year old woman gave me a mixtape, man. Score, you know? And she's like, yeah, it's all Christian rock. You'll like this. And I went home after church. I literally ran right upstairs and sat down in my room and I, I put it in my jam box. Remember you used to walk around with your jam box, you know what I mean? <laughs> loud and proud, and I put it in my jam box and played this first song, and it was about a guy who wears masks 
and doesn't know who he is. It was called chameleon. And like the hair started standing up on my body. I'm like, I'm chameleon. And I was like, oh! And I could tell God had found me. I still didn't know what to do. I was like, okay, God, I'm a little freaked out. What do I do next? And I didn't get anything in that moment. So I was just like, I, I don't know what this means. Next Sunday, there's a big announcement during the church service. Everyone's excited. We're getting a new pastor, and it's a youth pastor. Now, I don't even know what a youth pastor is. I'm like, is it gonna be like a like child? Like there's a youth pastor, you know? And they explain, no, this is a pastor. It's just for students, and I'd never heard of such a thing. I was like, huh, that's a novel idea. And he got up, and uh, he said, hey, I'm inviting all the teenagers. If you're interested in your faith, you wanna know more about God and what it means to follow Jesus, come and hang out at my house. And it was like Jesus was sitting next to me. I could just feel him pinching my shoulder. I'm like, I know I need to, I know I need to go. And I went to Dan's house, and that guy put his arm around me, and he's mentored me for 30 plus years. And he helped me find my identity in Christ. See, God found me. <laughs> I didn't find him. He found me. And I'm telling you, God is doing this millions of times every day. Let him find you. Listen for him speaking your name. And be open to him being involved in your life. You're gonna feel like maybe you're a little crazy. <laughs> but it's real. In our memory verse this week, it, it talks so clearly about these two movements of God seeing us and us seeing God. And I, I wanna bring your attention to it in closing. It's Psalm 121, verses one through two. And we're trying to memorize these again to get them deep inside of us. So if you memorized it, I invite you to say it out loud with me together. Psalm 121, verses one through two. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Now, first of all, the psalmist is saying, listen, I'm in a valley, but I look up because I am trusting that God sees me. And the one who made the mountains, as big as he is, he sees me. And theologians call this transcendence, that God is transcendent. And you can write this down. Here's the definition for transcendent. It means this, that God is up above everything, that he is independent and superior to the rest of the universe, and we desperately need God to be transcendent. We need to know that he is not bound by things that control us. This is super important to get. He is the maker of heaven and earth. In other words, if God is not great, if God is not transcendent, then he's not big enough to help us with our problems. Can I get an amen? We need a God who's so big. And the Bible teaches that God is transcendent. Nothing on earth ever worries him or panics him or challenges his capacity. You know when you're lifting something heavy, you make try sounds like, Aah! and you're gonna have like a hernia? God never makes try sounds. It's never hard for him. Heaven never panics. God's got it. Can I get an amen? And the psalmist says, man, that's my God, the maker of heaven and earth. But he says, this is the one from where my help comes from. In other words, this great big God comes down to little old me. He comes all the way down. And this may be the hardest thing for us to believe because it's like, well, why would God do that? Because I'm good enough and impressive enough? Nope. Because I earned it and I deserve it? Nope because that's who God is. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can ever do that will make him love you less. And in Jesus, God comes so near. In fact, the ultimate image of God that Jesus wants us to have in the mental gallery of our heart, you know what it is? You can write this down. It's these four little letters, A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, Abba. Abba, and you're like, well, what is, is that like a 70s disco group? What is, what is that, you know? Well, turn to page 41 or 42 in your uh, belief book, and look at Matthew 6. We're gonna go down to verse 26 and 27. Jesus says this, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He's a heavenly Father. He's a perfect dad. 
And he says, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? See, before Jesus, no Jew dared to speak to God as father. God was this holy, eternal, strong, immortal, transcendent one. But Jesus came to show us the truest face of God. And the, rev the revolutionary revelation of Jesus about who God is, is that God is our father. He is our perfect dad. And Jesus used this very special word, this very tender word, an Aramaic word, Abba. And see, if you were in the first century and you were a Jew inside of a family that spoke Aramaic, the first words out of a little baby's mouth was typically, ah, ah, abba. It means dada. There's never been another religious leader besides Jesus who said, okay, I'm gonna teach you how to pray and we have to start with baby talk. He's your daddy. And see, theologians call this, you can write it down, a big fat word, Eminence. And see, it means this, that God is present and active in nature and history. Quite simply, it means God is near. Like when a father holds a newborn baby on his bare chest and they simply breathe together. What difference did Jesus make through his life, his death, his resurrection? To the Jews who would not even pronounce or even spell out the letters in God's name, Jesus taught him, taught us to approach God as our daddy, the perfect dad. That's who he is. And Jesus, God has come close. So I want to ask you in closing to just reflect on these questions this week, to open up a journal, take some notes. I triple dog dare you to do this. See, first God sees you, right? Here's some questions to reflect on that. God saw Hagar by finding her. In what areas of your life are you on Broken Boulevard? Where do you just need to admit you're lost and need found? And stop pretending. Remember, God saw Hagar by calling her name. How can you be still this week and listen for God to speak your name? And God saw Hagar by engaging the details of her life. And let me ask you, how can you be more open to and aware of God's involvement in your life? And then finally, you will see God. So reflect on these questions. What warped images of God do you need to let go of? You might have had a bad mom or a bad dad, and it's time to just imagine the opposite. God is not like your parents. There may be some things you need to let go of. Number two, how is the image of God in your heart too small? How have you shrunk him down? Or how is the image of God in your heart too distant? And here we are, we're back to the beginning. And rather than being overconfident children that are like, I'll tell you what God is like, we come to Jesus and we say, Lord, guide my hand, teach me. I don't know how to draw your picture. Will you teach me? And here's what the Lord will teach us. And I invite you to say it with me. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.